Uh, we say good morning today from Washington, D.C., where we're broadcasting this uh, webinar. This webinar today has a title of Ukraine Facing Serious New and Severe Challenges. As you know, if you've been following the news, there's a lot of things that's been happening and Ukraine's got enough challenges without some of these new ones. Uh, the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council was started in Washington, D.C. in 1995. So we've been working on Ukraine issues uh, for 28 years. Uh, I started working in Ukraine in 1993. So I've been working on Ukraine for 30 years. And... Uh, it's uh, amazing to see what's happened. And of course, our distinguished ambassador has been working on Ukraine for, for a long, long time. And when we started, we just had a few members. <clears throat> and in 2007, when I took over, we had 30 members. Now we have 230 members and we're the largest uh, not-for-profit uh, member-based trade association specifically for Ukraine, not heads quartered inside Ukraine. We'd like to say that uh, we're one of our most uh, interesting speeches, sp speakers and the ones that our members like is Ambassador John Herbst. John Herbst was the ambassador to Ukraine during the Orange Revolution. And then he's been at the War College and then the Atlantic Council and he heads up the uh, uh, the European and Ukraine program at the Atlantic Council. Uh, he's had a long distinguished career and he makes uh, comments, uh, analysts, uh, commentaries, writes, and manages the program. So at this point, we're also happy today that Congresswoman uh, Marcy Kaptur is going to join us here shortly. Marcy Kaptur is uh, uh, has Ukrainian heritage, and she's been very uh, leading spokesman for Ukraine in Washington, and she's the longest service serving congressperson uh, the, the United States has ever had. So there I see uh, Marcy coming on. Uh, Marcy, can you hear all of us? I can hear you. Can you hear me, Morgan? Okay, good. Well, Mar Marcy, we, of course, we're broadcasting today from Washington, D.C. I just brought a few comments about the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. We've been serving for 28 years, but we're no match for your service in the House of Representatives as you're the longest serving one. And how many years is that now, Marcy? It is actually 41 years. 41 years. Oh, my gracious. <laughs> That's a tremendous it just gets record. more interesting. It just gets more interesting every year. <laughs> and, uh, and I just introduced John Herbst to those who are attending today. We have over 150 people who are attending. And uh, I want to introduce Nadia Komazuk. Nadia is my mm -hmm. colleague. She works with me on all these webinars, and we're very appreciative for the mm -hmm. work that she does. Good morning. Marcy, Good morning. Marcy as you know, the... Uh, title of our webinar today is Ukraine is facing serious and new challenges. And you know what many of those are. We've got a new speaker in the house. We've got uh, the war over there with Hamas and Israel. We've got uh, Russia looking for new partners. We've got some dissension within the EU. We've got lots of questions being asked about long-term financing that's needed to win this war. So Ukraine had enough challenges, but now we've got a lot more. So we're going to take a look at those challenges and kind of analyze them. And uh, we're very pleased that you would join us today. So let's, uh, uh, Ambassador and uh, Nadia, let's turn it over to uh, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. Marcy, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Morgan. And thank you for the phenomenal work that you have done. Uh, relative to ushering Ukraine in to the community of European nations. Uh, thank you uh, to Ambassador Herbst. I guess I have to formally introduce him in just a second here, uh, but uh, truly an extraordinary human being and a great servant to our country. 
uh, over many, many decades, longer, I think, than I've served in Congress. So <laughs> that's quite an achievement. And uh, Nadia, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today as well. I'll be very quick and say, obviously, we in the House today uh, are debating additional assistance uh, for Ukraine. It will be controversial. It is controversial right now. We have an untested new speaker who has held his position for just a few uh, days, actually. So uh, we um, uh, expect to be on the floor this afternoon, the floor of the House, uh, debating this. I will be one of the many speakers uh, supporting the president's request for uh, continuing assistance to the nation of Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, the way that the bill has been drafted, the Ukraine portion uh, stands alone. It's been decoupled from the um, assistance to uh, Israel and uh, other elements of, of the legislation, which is uh, unfortunate in, in my opinion. Uh, this is a choice of the new Speaker of the House. It is an unfortunate choice, but he is a new Speaker and is not, uh, in my opinion, someone who has spent a lot of time focused on our European relations and uh, particularly the challenges uh, to Ukraine uh, by Russia's uh, war on Ukraine. So um, there was an article in yesterday's Wall Street Journal I thought was particularly insightful uh, by uh, William Glad uh, Galston, William Galston. And what he says in this article is that uh, the question really is, it's easy to see the upfront costs of aiding beleaguered friends and, and allies and uh, in distant lands, but it's harder to understand the longer term costs of failing to do so. And it's uh, to you, all of your credit that you continue to uh, educate uh, the American people and people beyond our borders that abandoning Ukraine, as Mr. Galston said, would send uh, shockwaves through the American-led alliances that have defended democracy and kept uh, peace among the great powers since World War II uh, with incalculable consequences for us all. So there are many uh, informed voices out there. And my main message this morning is keep it up because persistence matters and obviously liberty matters the most. And um, uh, we face a growing number of challenges uh, I think one of the issues that everyone who's listening and those of you who have been kindly invited to be guests, I think it's important to keep elucidating about Russia's role in the Middle East and that Israel, uh, obviously Israel, Ukraine have been tied together as well as the China Seas issues uh, in the original legislation. And now Ukraine has been decoupled from that uh, as well as the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, Indo but um I think it's really important for people to understand uh, they don't know Russia has a, you know, a long-term base in Syria. They don't know uh, what Russia has said about um, uh, the recent uh, invasion of Gaza uh, uh, or the uh, terrible, terrible Hamas killings that occurred in Israel uh, just a few days before that. Uh, people are not aware of Russia's role in the Middle East. And I think that um, I read one article that talked about Kalashnikov uh, weapons being found within Gaza. You know, uh, Russia is not a uh, inert player uh, in all of this, including in the Middle East. And some of my own colleagues don't really appreciate that. So I'm just pointing that out as something that um, I think in the next several days, as the Senate considers this bill and so forth, uh, we need to clarify uh, into which category of nations, what was Hamas doing in Russia recently, uh, the um, uh, Iranian role in uh, funding um, uh, activities throughout the Middle East that are very destabilizing and then providing all the drones for Ukraine. There, there are uh, lots of examples here uh, where Russia has been a very, very divisive and destructive force. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Uh, there are many uh, viewers uh, that of your uh, efforts as well as C-SPAN and so forth who've been calling in. I've been so impressed with average citizens who are calling in and, and paying attention. So just have confidence that your, uh, that your efforts truly matter. 
And uh, as we move toward these votes in the House, uh, this morning, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to, in uh, what would I call him, Ambassador Extraordinaire, uh, Ambassador John Herbst, was Senior Director, or is Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center, and served for 31 years as a Foreign Service Officer in the U.S. Department of State. That's a, uh, this is a real patriot. Uh, I first met the ambassador when he was uh, ambassador to Ukraine from 2003 to 2006 and uh, did so very much uh, for Ukraine in those difficult years. But prior to that, had been ambassador to Uzbekistan. Who can say that? Uh, and uh, these countries that were newly forming after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In his last four years at the State Department, he served as coordinator for reconstruction and stabilization, leading our government's civilian capacity and societies that were trans transitioning from conflict to civil strife. What an astounding uh, background and served as U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem. So he certainly knows uh, what Russia's perspective has been in the Soviet Union uh, prior to Russia, uh, their perspective on the Middle East. And uh, he was stationed in, in Jerusalem and was also uh, in his former capacities, principal deputy and ambassador at large for the newly independent states. Boy, was that a heavy burden. And he's always been so happy. I mean, going through all these things, you know, that are very, very difficult, has such a very good nature and was director of the Office of Independent States and Commonwealth Affairs. So um, served in the embassies in Tel Aviv and Moscow and Saudi Arabia. And uh, he most recently served as director of the Center for Complex Operations at National Defense University and received the Presidential Distinguished Service Award and the Secretary of State's Career Achievement Award. Uh, his writings are extensive and Ambassador Herbst, I know from my own many, many journeys to Ukraine when I met you, you made things happen that were constructive that no one else had. So it is just an honor to be able to introduce you uh, this morning and to participate in this very important dialogue. Thank you, Morgan, and thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Well, thank um, you very much, Marcia. You've been, uh, of course, one of the first and longest uh, supporters of Ukraine. You've always been co-chair of the Ukrainian uh, Congressional Caucus. And what we like is you speak out, you tell the truth, and you're honest, and uh, you uh, fight hard there on Capitol Hill. And, of course, we need you now more than ever. So thank you very much for joining today. We're always proud to have you on the Ukraine side. And thanks for your kind comments about Ambassador Herbst. I met him first when I was an election observer in 2004, and he gave us a briefing. And none of us had met him before. We knew quickly that he was astute, that he was a, that he had his hands and in mind on what was going on. And he was there when the night the Kuchma had to decide whether to send the troops to Ukraine, uh, to Kiev or not to send the troops to Kiev. So he was in there during that very hot time. So now we'll turn to John. John, as you know, uh, the U.S. Ukraine Business Council, number one goal in, in, in the 23 is to uh, promote economic investment in Ukraine, get more investment in there, keep the companies in there working, keep them with their employees, keep them within the humanitarian area. Or secondly, we still need to make it a better and easy place to do business. And our third one is throw Putin out now. So those are our three major goals. And uh, you've been involved in them. But then, like we said, all of a sudden, comes along a whole bunch of new challenges. The House Speaker, I think, who's voted against most all Ukraine appropriations bills. Uh, and then you got the war and a lot of things. Other. So Ukraine's plate was full, but now it's double full. So uh, <clears throat> we, I'm turning it over to you and talk to us about how you observe all these new challenges and mixed into the old ones and how we're going on down the road in 23 and 24 and eventually win this war. Morgan, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's especially a pleasure to be here with Congresswoman Kaptur, with whom we've done many things together over the years. 
It's always it's always wonderful. I must say that um, I'm not fond of hyperbole, except I'm a bit more forgiving when it applies to me. So keep, keep in mind that I'm not quite what you heard, I'm much less than that. But there are, I would say, three or perhaps four challenges that are very much on the agenda, not just for Ukraine, but for American interests. Because I think that American interests require um, all the support we can provide so that Ukraine wins this war against Mr. Putin. So let's start with the first challenge, which, which is what's going on in the battlefield. Um, there's been a great deal of pessimism in the mainstream media uh, about the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Lots of discussion of the failure of that counteroffensive and the notion that we're now in a stalemate or a war of attrition. This is um, an exaggeration. The counteroffensive did not deliver a major victory to Ukraine on land. There's no doubt about that. The only question is why are reporters speaking as if this was likely? Those of you who've, who've heard me talk since March know that I've said Ukraine would enjoy modest success, which I defined as the liberation of several hundred square kilometers of territory, unless the United States in particular, but NATO in general, sent Ukraine all the weapons it needed to break the land bridge to Crimea. We have not sent those weapons, therefore to have expected a major breakthrough made no sense. But in fact, the situation on the battlefield is better than the modest success Ukraine has enjoyed on land, because they've had, in fact, spectacular success at sea. Without a navy, they have driven the Russian navy out of Sevastopol. The Russian navy is now hiding in the eastern Black Sea. It's worth remembering that when Putin launched his big invasion in February of last year, one of his most potent weapons was the Black Sea fleet sending missiles Ukraine's way from distances close to Odessa. Well, the, again, the Russian Black Sea Fleet is now a couple of hundred square, couple of hundred kilometers or more than that from Odessa, more like three or 400 kilometers from Odessa because of the success of Ukraine's drone strikes. Most of which, by the way, were not with Western equipment. They were with Ukrainian maritime drones. So that's the war. Then you have, and related to that, which is why I said there were three or four challenges, the media presentation of the war. But on the media presentation, let me mention one thing which I imagine most everyone um, in this webinar has heard of or has read. That was the Time article by um, um, Schuster, uh, which came out a week or two ago, which suggested that great, great pessimism in Kiev about the war. Um, it was revealed on Twitter just like in the last couple of days that the principal source for that story was Mr. Aristovich, whose partisan views are well known to people who follow Ukraine. Um, therefore, the trustworthiness of the information provided in that article is subject to very serious question. So just for all of you to be aware of that, because I know that article had, had an unfortunate impact. Um, it really was a form of I don't like using this word because it's overused, but it was a form of disinformation, which did hit the mark. So we, we can clearly push this article aside now that we know that. Okay, so now we come to something that folks um, who've paid attention to my views have heard me say many times. Ukraine will win this war as long as American support remains at least as strong as it is now. And you know that I've criticized the administration for a while. It has the right approach, and it has what I call an adequate policy. It has not pursued that adequate policy with vigor, which would lead to a faster Ukrainian victory. And that is one of the two challenges which has been with us for some time, the caution of the administration. The second challenge, which in fact is greater now and more dangerous, is a challenge coming from the six or eight or maybe 10 members of the Freedom Caucus on the Republican side in the House who are trying to make sure that no aid 
from the United States henceforth gets there to Ukraine. And Congresswoman Kaptur talked about this briefly. Let me offer you my um, sense of where things are right now, subject to correction by the Congresswoman, who, after all, is serving in the House. Uh, it was obviously not a good thing that Speaker McCarthy was defenestrated. It's not a good thing that the new Speaker, um, Congressman Johnson, um, has separated for the moment, aid to Ukraine from aid to Israel. Uh, it is a good thing, and this relates to the first challenge, the Biden administration, but has an impact on the second challenge coming from the, the firebrand Republicans, that the president in his Oval Office speech, which was excellent, uh, pointed out the obvious thing that people like me have been saying for years, that we have a vital stake in this war because if Ukraine falls to Putin, his next stop is going to be the Baltic states and the cost of the United States. And this is the point that Congresswoman Kaptur made citing Galston in the Wall Street Journal. The cost of the United States is going to go way up beyond the $37 billion a year we are sending to Ukraine. And it's not just going to be American treasure, American dollars, but perhaps American blood, if in fact Putin were to stumble into a war in the Baltics. The point, I'm, the reason why I'm mentioning this in connection with Johnson is when he came out of his meeting with Biden in the White House, he essentially said that. And we know he has not been sound on Ukraine in the past. But saying that, he is, in a sense, acknowledging the American interests at stake. And at the same time, he is indicating, although I'm not saying this is how it will play out, he'd be willing to put an independent, excuse me, a bill on the floor on aid to Ukraine. There's lots of speculation, again, Congress Copter may know a lot more than I do about this, that some sort of deal was brokered, especially with Congressman McCall, the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee, House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, who sound on Ukraine. I'm not saying that's true, but it's plausible. Uh, anyway, we will see. I would also add, and this is really inside baseball politics, but it's so obvious, I'm amazed that it happened. Uh, the Republicans who put that bill on the floor for aid to Israel made a serious error when they tied that to defunding or partly defunding the IRS, which everyone knows will not be acceptable to any Democrat in either chamber. So that bill is going to go nowhere. And if, in fact, the Republicans care so much about Israel that they had to detach it from Ukraine, why are they playing political games with this? And I think that will haunt haunt that, hurt them in their dealings with strong, staunch supporters of Israel in the United States, and not just in, on the Democratic side of the ledger. So I'm not sure why they did it, but I think that was a tactical error. And it makes it easier for the president to make the point, as he did, um, was it yesterday or the day before, that he would veto that bill, because it's not what he wants. That gives him cover from friends of Israel for vetoing the bill. Because they understand, again, someone's playing politics with aid to Israel. So that makes me a bit more optimistic that this problem of aid will get fixed. Uh, no guarantees, but I think the odds are going up. And I think that mistake is one of the reasons for it. Now let's go back to the other challenge. The challenge of getting the administration to be bolder in sending the weapons Ukraine needs. Uh, we saw just a very recent example based upon a positive but not strong enough administration decision to send the lower range attackums to Ukraine. Um, they are once again denying Ukraine the longer range attackums, which are the more effective ones that Ukraine desperately needs. But we saw that even with these lo lower range attackums, which do not have the big explosive warhead, it has uh, cluster munitions, the Ukrainians took out right away 21 Russian helicopters. Because those low, the lower range attackums go 150 kilometers, which is more than 85 kilometer HIMARS, which had been the previous extended range of U.S. supplied missiles. And again, with these high, with these attackums, they had a major tactical victory. They've also been doing wonderful work, not just with um, these attackums, but with the, the storm challenges sent from the Brits and other weapons taking out the most advanced Russian um, anti-aircraft radar, the S-400s, in Crimea and elsewhere. Uh, major victories which our arms 
uh, made possible. But if we were truly serious about getting Ukraine to victory, we would be, we'd be sending the longer range attackums. We'd make sure that the F-16s, which we've agreed to send, get to Ukraine in bulk, which we have not made a commitment to, and quickly, which we have not made a commitment to. We're dragging our feet through the training process uh, fast enough. Um, if we send Ukraine more tanks, we're only sending 31 Abrams. We could we could great, vastly increase that number. F-16s in quantity, attackums in quantity, and other things like demining uh, equipment. Ukraine could launch a very serious and effective counteroffensive. So we've got to make sure the aid start continues to flow or get, gets restarted, I should say. And that's the problem, problem we've got on the Republican side. We've got to get a bolder approach to, this, to the basic strong, sound strategy of the Biden administration on the Democratic side, and things will turn in the right direction. But this is a period where there's a fair amount of pessimism. It's circulating wildly, but that pessimism is not validated. There's reason for concern. I am deeply concerned, but no reason to panic and no reason to do anything other than to, you know, to uh, hitch up our pants and more with greater vigor proceed. You're muted, Morgan. John, thank you very much for those observations. Uh, Marcy's still with us. Let's give her a chance to to respond to any of those observations if, if she wishes. Marcy, would you like to unmute? And uh, uh, thank you so very. If you have any comments related to uh, John's observations. Uh, well, first of all. Uh, I have to be extremely brief because we were just called for some votes. So I have to exit and then I will come back. I want to thank um, uh, Ambassador Herbst for his really enlightened, organized comments. You helped me put things in boxes that are floating around in my head. I think um, <clears throat> the um, I think you are spot on. Um, I know that many listeners today may be parts of the business community, and I wanted to comment on that because I think it is very important for Ukraine to succeed in um, making sure that they can manufacture and uh, provide some of their own necessities. And uh, I know that they are looking for uh, companies to partner with, and some of that is already going on. But uh, uh, Ukraine is very agile and very, very committed to its own uh, defense. And uh, I know that there will be many Western companies interested in uh, uh, exploring that topic more. So uh, I just wanted to uh, place that on the table. Uh, I also wanted to say that the valor of and the, the will of the Ukrainian military is, is extraordinary. It is impressing everyone, I can just tell you that, um, who has the opportunity to uh, observe and uh, uh, our administration has been very, very slow to get weapons in there many times, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> hoping that our European partners would step to the table equally or even before we do. So I think that those relationships are extremely important uh, for Ukraine. And it isn't just the United States, but the United States in partnership uh, with, <clears throat> with many other countries. So we have to acknowledge all of them, including Canada, uh, our closest neighbor. So um, <clears throat> I um, just wanted to uh, say that today is going to be, I think, a bit bumpy. Unfortunately, the Freedom Caucus is an unusual group of people who can't seem to get along themselves, and they don't get along with their own colleagues. You will note that the chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee, Kay Granger of Texas, yesterday announced her retirement, leaving after next year. Uh, there are many good people, very experienced people, who uh, frankly are tired of the, I can't speak for her, but just a general mood that in the House of Representatives, we need to elect adults. And uh, many of the adults are saying, you know, uh, this isn't uh, what I was elected to do. And we have to just continue to work harder 
uh, to uh, prevail here in the House. I think it will happen, but it'll be more slow. It won't be, it'll be more complicated. Uh, the Senate has very good legislation related to Ukraine and uh, on a bipartisan basis, the Senate is ready to roll. So uh, I think that their leadership is very much appreciated at this point. I just wanted to make one point before I vote, if I could. And that is for all of the um, members of NATO, um, for let, let's take Lithuania. Um, they have friends across this country, across the United States. Lithuanian embassy has consulates, the Estonian embassy. Uh, they need to activate their uh, representatives publicly to tell their story. Because I have learned in my own work now going around the country, how many Americans do not understand the history of this country, nor of the struggle for liberty. And we have a massive educational job uh, on our hands, believe it or not. And I think if, for example, let me give an example. Uh, we have a large Ukrainian American population in Cleveland. We don't as often hear from the Lithuanian or Estonian, but the Cleveland City Club invites guests of different kinds. And if one or two of these consulates would come in and they would talk about individuals who fled Russian repression or Soviet repression and what their families endured. They would make the story real for thousands and thousands and thousands of people. An organization like the Cleveland City Club or any Rotary Club, I mean, pick the numbers of organizations that exist in our country um, and tell the story of what it's like to actually live under Soviet or Russian rule. Uh, this is not being done effectively in my opinion. And so whether we're talking about Poland and the number of consulates it has across the United States and consulars in different places, uh, and I, I think that uh, National Public Radio should have a whole series uh, of like story, story court, where these various stories of real Americans whose families have survived hell and what it's like, what Russian rule really means, because there is so much counter propaganda out there um, uh, starting with the Olympics and all, I could go through this uh, long list of where Russia fal falsifies the truth. And um, my goodness, they've just uh, captured another uh, US um, uh, journalist. And um, this is not getting out in the public realm as much as it should. So I just wanted to put that on the table. When I put together Romanian, Moldovan, uh, Estonian, Polish, uh, Slovenian, all the different countries where we have people now in our country uh, that have survived, it isn't just Ukrainians. It is the NATO alliance. It is the people who fought for liberty uh, for most of the 20th century and the legacy of that century bequeathed to us. So um, I, I wanted to put that on the table. Of, if you have hundreds of listeners today, they can think about their own community of elevating these stories. We in Toledo have just produced a film with, Nat, with our public television station called Freedom Means Never Surrender. It is the story of a Polish couple uh, that lived in our community for many, many years. I pointed out, it was shown on channel 30 starting in September of this year. Uh, it's a local her heroin hero story, but it people were shocked. They never knew the truth about what this family had endured. So I just put that out there as something that's very practical to help educate and inform the American people as we win this victory with Ukraine. Thank you, and I apologize, I must go vote. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marcy. Uh, John, uh, one thing that you mentioned was the cost of uh, containing and defeating Putin if he wins Ukraine. There's a lot more coming out about that. You know, how they say what better deal could the United States have? We're providing mainly hardware and money. The Ukrainians are the ones that are fighting and dying on their soil. Uh, to protect democracy, to protect themselves. And then everybody's saying, if we don't spend the money now, it'll cost a lot more in the future of US and maybe even US soldiers to defeat his other expansion, expansion plans. Can you explain a little more about that, that rational reasoning and logic? Well, for sure. If if Putin were to win in Ukraine, um, we would have to increase substantially our NATO-related defense expenditures. 
uh, putting more hardware, maybe even more troops into countries adjoining both Russia and Russian occupied Ukraine. So you immediately have that cost. Uh, you would also have the risk of Putin committing aggression, stumbling into war over the Baltic states, in which case American troops, they, that would send our expenses through the roof as we in a war that would also involve the death of American soldiers. So that 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 is that is the risk. And let, let's let's be clear about the amount of money we're spending. It's 37 billion a year at the present time. There are larger figures out there, but that's that's the, the best data we've got. That represents about four percent of our defense budget. Only four percent. With that four percent of our defense budget, and of course also the Europeans are spending a lot, sending a lot of um, aid to Ukraine as well, more than we are. Uh, Ukraine has destroyed approximately 50% of Russia's conventional military capability. In other words, Russia is a lot weaker as a result of this war. And as long as they do not win it, that will remain to be true. So that's for 4% of our defense budget to take out 50% of the Russia's conventional military capability is a darn good return on investment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, let's go on to uh, back to the uh, conflict there in Israel. We know that Israel's supported heavily by the United States for a long time. So when they come in, it takes some of the air out of the room. You know, when we're trying to talk and build Ukraine, we're also going to be providing them some money. It's another conflict. It could it contribute to. Uh, fatigue. So uh, people are saying, how are we going to keep Ukraine going when when everybody's talking about Israel and this, and uh, that limits the ability to talk about Ukraine when, and it's more concerned for those people who don't want the U.S. involved in multiple conflicts. So how, I mean, they're now talking about it maybe going on a long time. So additional, oh, observations from you and we want to say that we're going to take questions from the chat line and the Q&A line so please send in more questions in the chat as we go along here talk a little mm -hmm. more about this Israel thing and and is it is it going to be a neutral is it going to be really a negative on Ukraine or there's a way to be positive or uh, right now people are saying it's a pretty negative impact on Ukraine because of you know, all the things we know about. Uh, I think it, it is, um, on balance, a positive. In fact, I would say it's easily, on balance, a positive. It is, I have to say, on balance because there are um, complicating factors. For example, some of the equipment that Israel needs, Ukraine also needs. So that may mean a little bit less of that equipment gets to Ukraine than otherwise. But that's the only negative that I see. Um, here are the positives. First, uh, the president and key Democrats and Republicans in both houses very much want to move aid to Ukraine at the same time as aid to Israel. That's uh, a plus because far fewer people in Congress are willing to block aid to Israel. There aren't that many in Congress who want to block aid to Ukraine, but their number is still far larger than those who would be willing to block aid to Israel. And it's quite possible that at the end of the day, the two aid packages will be delivered uh, as one. Uh, the other point is that people who don't understand that Russia is a rogue actor working strongly against American interests now have one more reason to change their mind. Uh, Congresswoman Kaptur pointed out 
that not many people in the U.S. understand Moscow's dangerous policy in the Middle East. Now we're seeing it. Uh, Hamas was received very favorably in Moscow just a few days ago. More important than that, uh, Russia has become a big supporter of the Hamas wish for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu, who was overly indulgent of Russian aggression against Ukraine, is now mad as hell. A very senior advisor of his, I forget his name, was on um, Russian TV, where he was slamming them for their perfidy vis-a-vis Israel. Now, Russian perfidy, Kremlin perfidy, does not surprise me. It's not surprise leaders in Israel, but apparently it did. But it's, it's positive that they now understand that and are saying that publicly. So this is another plus uh, for Ukraine. And as I already mentioned in talking about the Israeli um, standalone aid bill, um, the firebrand Republicans did themselves a disservice by adding in that um, IRS component, which calls again into question their um, support for Israel. So I, I look at all these things, I see greater clarity in the United States about evil Russian intentions, which again, enhances the argument to aid Ukraine. Okay, John, uh, there's lots of talk now about this war being a, you know, going on for a while and the high cost of keeping Ukraine in the war and financing the Ukraine government. Uh, you know, you've got some speculation in the United States some some dissension in the EU. How do you see the long run picture for the United States and the international banks, the EU and others to keep the financing going that Ukraine needs to for yeah. their own government to buy the weapons they need? And uh, you know, it uh, it's gonna be a, continue to be a lot, if not more, and it's gotta move forward. It's not just the military equipment, they've got to have money also. So how do you at see the, the long-run financing picture to keep at the, in this game and lead it to victory? At the present time, European support for Ukraine is rock solid. Uh, we can't say that, sadly, at the moment, about American aid for the reasons we've been discussing. Uh, but I, again, I think the odds are well over 50%. Not, not 99%, not 80%, but well over 50% that we're going to come out of this providing major aid to Ukraine. If that's true, then no problems. Now, you're right, Morgan, that there is greater criticism in the United States of economic support to Ukraine. And you're right, that that economic support is just about or as critical for Ukraine's survival and eventual victory as military support. But the politics of the economic aid, especially budget support in the United States um, is difficult. So I could easily see uh, a major aid package passing which is full up on military aid and slim down on economic assistance. Uh, the result of that would be the need for Europe to enhance its economic aid to Ukraine. And economic aid to Ukraine is less controversial within the EU than it is in the United States. And the ideal solution, which is not the one I necessarily say we'll see, but we might, is that we will, in fact, boost our military aid over what it had been, reduce the economic aid, and enables Europe to boost its economic aid and perhaps reduce some of its military aid. But I think this is a manageable proposition. But again, a complicating uh, factor. On the plus side, John, there's a... Uh... Of course, a huge interest from the U.S. military uh, sector, and it's not just the fact that they sell weapons. They are. We've talked to many of their top executives. They're they're captured by this uh, fight against Ukraine. 
they're on Ukraine's side as companies because they know they stand for freedom, they stand for independence, they stand for all the things that we would lose. And if anybody wants to think about what Ukraine would look like under Putin, just read Anna Annenbaum's op-ed of a few months ago. She went a long op-ed and described in detail what she thought Ukraine would look like under Putin. Concentration camps, uh, you know, uh, people being killed, uh, all the kinds of things that uh, even happened in the Soviet Union, more than happening in Ukraine. It was really sad and scary to read her commentary, and I think it was true what she said Ukraine would look like uh, under Putin. And so more people need to think about what Ukraine would look like under Putin and in his step to advance his interest. Uh, but one of the good things is these military companies, uh, they want to have a footprint in Ukraine. Ukraine's got a lot of uh, IT. They got a lot of advanced making weapons. But the U.S. companies want a footprint there. They want to manufacture there. They want to partner. They want to get involved and move with some stuff from Poland. But Ukraine needs to improve their business environment. Because we've kept saying for a long time, they need to have more rule of law. It's still too complicated to do business there. And Ukraine, U.S. companies are having trouble finding companies in Ukraine to partner with. So the Ukraine government held a meeting with the defense companies in the United States saying they're not doing enough to make it so we can do business in Ukraine. They're not improving the business environment. They're not improving the way we can work with Ukraine companies. So part of this is still needs to be done by the Ukraine government. So let's talk about things the Ukraine government needs to get more private sector investment in there and to... Uh, take care of complaints about corruption and others from donors who want transparency. Look, uh, I've been here at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center for almost 10 years. And before the Russian big invasion, we paid almost as much attention to reform in Ukraine as to Russia's war on Ukraine. Uh, since the big invasion, you know, we were overwhelmingly working on the war. Uh, and I, I mention that because I believe far and away the greatest disincentive to investment in Ukraine is, is the Russian war. Because, as you know, they are bombing everywhere in Ukraine. And so assets in any part of the country are vulnerable. Uh, having said that, the issue of reform remains very important. This is a significant disincentive to FDA, FDI. And I think, though, that we are in a reasonably good place to deal with it. Why? Because a year ago, more than a year ago, the EU offered Ukraine accession talks. And those are well underway. I was just in Kiev last week. I saw Deputy Prime Minister Stephanie Shina, who's responsible both for NATO and the EU. We talked about both. And she told us about the document, the very huge, huge document that they had prepared and presented to the EU uh, as part of the accession talks process. So I am confident uh, as a result of the commitment from the EU to bring Ukraine in that much of the uh, institutionalization of corruption in Ukraine is going to be in the rearview mirror. You no, know, not tomorrow, um, but in the course of, and certainly at the end of the accession process. Uh, I also think we've seen some clear steps taken on corruption as uh, President Zelensky wants to make sure that that's not going to be a bar to continued Western assistance. Uh, to Ukraine, so Ukraine will win this war. Well, thank you for that. And what we always want to emphasize is the U.S. defense sector is private. When they go to Ukraine, they're private companies. They create private jobs. Oh. And as you know, they're well-financed and they're well-structured. Some of them have 180,000 employees. Some of them have 150, 60. 
they know what to do. They work in many countries. So to get them in Ukraine has just a unlimited benefits for the private sector in Ukraine and to cooperate with the private defense sector that's expanding in Ukraine. Actually, Morgan, I forgot to mention um, after you first, when you first asked that question about the about U.S. Ukrainian military um, cooperation, excuse me, defense, possible defense production cooperation. Um, you're right that American arms manufacturers are deeply interested in Ukraine as a market and as a place where they're seeing their products in action and therefore we can adjust, they can um, uh, refine those products to make them more effective in the future. Um, it's also true that when we give assistance to Ukraine, we are giving them essentially retired weapons and then the United States military gets weapons to replace them which means the U.S. military is enhancing its own capacity as a result of this war. Uh, you know, we I've already talked about the caution, even timidity of the Biden administration in sending weapons to Ukraine. Sadly, that same caution we see as U.S. defense contractors are interested in putting their personnel into Ukraine and perhaps setting up joint production facilities the administration is not expediting this. In fact, it's dragging its feet in making it possible. And this is one more example of how their innate caution is getting in the way of a stronger policy that better serves American interests. Okay, Nadia, have you picked out some questions, the, the toughest ones for John? I like tough questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for... Um your questions and comments. Let's start with uh, Peter Borisov. Seems U.S. wants Ukraine to win, but is afraid of a defeated Russia. What do? How do we overcome fear to win? Uh, a very good question. Um, Peter's right that fear of a Russian defeat is one of the reasons for the tentativeness of the administration's policy. The other reason, which is actually, I think, the stronger one, hold, keeping the administration from pursuing a, a vigorous policy, is Putin's constant nuclear threats. Sadly, uh, the administration has self-deterred, has been intimidated by those threats. Uh, the administration seems to be unaware that we are nuclear power, too, and that we are as great, if not a greater threat to Russia than Russia is to us that in our history, we've never let nuclear intimidation deter us from doing what's necessary. But coming back to a Russian defeat, uh, there are a lot of urban myths out there about a possible Russian defeat. One is that Putin would be replaced by someone, quote unquote, worse. That's possible, but highly unlikely. Because the war on Ukraine, especially the big invasion, was a Putin special that even many of his own close advisors were not enthusiastic about. And of course, there's a history in Russia of a failed little war leading to major changes of a liberalizing variety. Happened after the Crimean War, happened after the Russo-Japanese War. You could even say for a time it happened after World War I. It also happened at the end of the Cold War. So, there's no reason to assume the worst. There's also a fear that Russia will fall apart. I think that fear is vastly overstated. A weakening of central control in Russia in the wake of a, vi of a victory for Ukraine is to be expected, but only a partial weakening. Anyway, so I think that that fear is one more reason for the caution, which seems to be a major characteristic of this administration's policy, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but also vis-a-vis -vis China, and for that matter, Iran. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we have a question from C C Cynthia Pasquale. Could you please comment on the next blinking official visit to China and how this visit might influence the war in Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, despite my criticism of administration caution, their overall policy is sound. And 
um, they're not backing away from that overall policy, even as they deal with the problem coming from these the small portion of the Freedom Caucus in the House. Uh, now, regarding China, we've seen a similar caution there in administration policy that we've seen on policy towards Russia. Uh, you know, you had this fiasco of the Chinese spy balloon over the United States and the administration reacted late and again without sufficient boldness. And then the Chinese took even those steps by the administration as an insult. And we kind of had to apologize in order to get Blinken to go to China. That was a mistake. I think when we show weakness vis-a-vis -vis China, we are also encouraging aggression by, by Russia, by Iran, by China itself. And so that's, that's an error. Uh, what Blinken's meetings in China, or for that matter, the upcoming, the soon to be summit meeting between Xi and Putin, how that affects uh, our policy towards Russia, towards Ukraine's eventual victory in this war, depends entirely upon how the administration conducts itself. If we let the Chinese know that the dual use technology they're sending to Russia is outrageous and sanctions may follow, if we let the Chinese know then we are going to be sending Ukraine all the weapons it needs to win, especially the longer range attack weapons, but F-16s again in, in, in number, Abrams tanks in number. Uh, we are setting ourselves up not just for Ukraine's victory, but also for deterring China from attacking Taiwan. That should be our objective. That's the way to achieve the objective. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I see Serhii Brailian from Baron Weather uh, raised his hand. I'm uh, promoting Serhii uh, to a panelist so he can ask a question. Serhii, if you if you hear us, unmute yourself and ask your question. And congratulations on your promotion. <laughs> um, Serhii, can you hear us? Can you speak? Okay, leave your question in the chat line. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. yes. Here you are. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, it's always a joy to listen to your insights. This is unlike reading some articles in time, which doesn't have, you know, disclosed sources and has personal opinions. But I have uh, several questions. One is, um, what is your opinion about the article in Economist by Commander Zaluzhny and specifically about his claims that Ukrainian army actually needs more help in aviation equipment, which I strongly support. And in that sense, why we still don't see U.S. equipment, which is way cheaper than F-16s like Black Hawks and Apaches, with way cheaper munitions and way easier deployment, uh, while Lockheed produces a lot of Black Hawks in Poland, for example. This is one question. And secondly, why the Land Lease Act? which was adopted in April 22 and signed in May, is still not being used by administration. Uh, and administration is still trying to take effort to push for uh, separate packages of supporting Ukraine, while Land Lease Act would open a full flood of supplying any equipment needed for Ukraine. So if you can at least give your opinion on those, I would really appreciate it. I think that the Lend-Lease Act was overwhelmingly symbolic as opposed to concrete. It was a demonstration of American support for Ukraine and intent to provide support. Um, it was never envisaged the way the Lend-Lease Act for Britain played out, whereas we actually leased British territory in exchange for the weapons. The real vehicle by which we've sent aid to Ukraine has been simple budget measures. That's the real game. And we've already discussed how that game is being played out. And the administration is at the present time holding firm that we should link aid to Ukraine, aid to Israel, because I think that would expedite the provision of aid to Ukraine. And I agree with that um, assessment. Uh, as for the specific aircraft you mentioned, Apaches, 
Black Hawk. Uh, I may be mistaken. I am aware of the list that Ukraine has sent in the past. I'm not sure that they were high up on the agenda in the way that attackums and the Abrams tanks and the F-16s. Uh, if they believe that would be very helpful, then I'm, I am supportive. I think Zaluzhny and his staff have been brilliant in this war, and we should take their requests seriously. But again, the, the problem is less any one, any single weapon system. The problem is the timidity of the administration in sending Ukraine all or nearly all the weapons it needs. And that timidity has been principally explained by fear of nuclear escalation. Now, the administration, of course, has moved in the right direction. It always moves in the right direction. It's just that the pace is not the pace that Ukraine needs. And for that matter, the pace that our interests require. And we're trying to work on that. And we have a little bit of success, but only a little bit. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. We have a question from Tom Austin from Trimble. Russia just raised the central bank interest rate to 15%. What do you see in the Russian economy? Is there a chance of this finally becoming a factor in ending the war? Um, the Russian economy has been hurt by sanctions in a serious way. Uh, many people dispute what I just said. And usually they base that their position on estimates made by the IMF and other international financial institutions that the Russian economy is growing at the rate of like 2%. The problem with that analysis, the IMF analysis and other iffy analysis, is it's based upon official Russian statistics. And why anyone trusts official Russian statistics as Putin wages this war in Ukraine is beyond me. And we know that the Russians are desperate for the lifting of sanctions because they're pushing it all the time, even as they deny the impact of sanctions. So sanctions are working, maybe not as effective as we would like, but they're having an impact. Uh, the standard of living in Russia has been going down um, pretty much since the war began in 2014 because serious sanctions were finally enacted in, on Russia by the early fall of 2014. Uh, so far, this has not been decisive, just as the weapons we've supplied have not been decisive. But we know that things within Russia are becoming more difficult. We know that the war is, despite the various polls that are coming out of the professional Levada Center, but anyone who thinks that your average Russian picking up the phone and being asked sensitive political questions is going to answer honestly, doesn't understand Russia, or thinks that Russians are, are, are idiots. So uh, the Levada Center polls, while done in a professional way, I don't think yield accurate results. Uh, so we saw in the whole Prigozhin mutiny, Putin's reluctance to crack down on Prigozhin. The fact that Putin relied on a bomb on a plane, which he could deny responsibility for, and taking down this guy who led a treasonous movement demonstrates weakness in the Putin edifice. Um, when that edifice crumbles, hard to say. But it is not that strong structure that uh, people spoke about for many, many years. Ambassador, one question I wanted to follow up with is uh, there's uh, about financing Ukraine. There's been talk now for months and months and months about how to use the Russian assets that are frozen. It's almost analysis paralysis now, as you know. You got uh, lots of experts walking on the technical and legal way. You got other people who are just saying, let's do it. It's the right thing to do. Russia should pay for. for Repair of uh, development in, in in Ukraine, so this just goes on and on, and, and almost no money goes to Ukraine, and so it's just an ongoing battle back and forth. Uh, 
So what do you what do you what's your analysis of this thing about using Russian assets? And is anybody ever going to decide to step up to the table and get through the bureaucratic uh, hurdles and and make money available to Ukraine? I agree. This is a very important issue. I also agree with um, Phil Zelico, Bob Zelik, a former head of the World Bank, former Deputy Secretary of State, and Larry Summer, former Secretary of the Treasury, President of Harvard, world-class economist, that these funds should be made available immediately for Ukraine's um, economic needs. Uh, sadly, there are several serious impediments to making them available to Ukraine. One, uh, senior officials in the West, including in Washington, would like to have those funds available for negotiations with Russia on ending the war as a chip. I think that's a mistake for a variety of reasons, which I will not go into because we don't have much time. Two, um, there are what I call green eye shade types in the international financial world who say this could shake uh, stability of the international financial system. I know that Zelik and Summer have been very effective at um, offering a different view to senior American officials here, including Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, and I believe they've had some progress. But that brings us to the third obstacle, which is the hand-wringing lawyers who say there's not adequate legal justification for doing it. Zelico pro produced a brilliant brief rebutting that. And there have been other approaches as well, including by the famous lawyer um, Larry Tribe at Harvard, or retired from Harvard. But still, it seems that lawyers in most government agencies in the West remain overly cautious. Uh, so between less reason one, you know, using this money as a chit for negotiations, and reason three, progress soon cannot be expected. But there are people working on it. We are trying to help them. And I don't rule out some progress being made, real progress, uh, in the medium term, nine months to a year and a half. But I have to say that's still a long shot. Okay, and then I, uh, I heard where Putin said the other day, if we if we start using those, he's going to find every uh, Western asset that he can freeze that's related to Russia some way, and he'd start freezing assets. I don't know what that amounts to, but, you know, again, he was saying, if you act, I will act. Well, uh, that's that's true. But what, what he fails to consider, or actually maybe he's considered it, but what, what, he, he would, what would be a problem for him if he does that is that there are still other Russian assets out there. In other words, that we could touch as well. We, the United States, we, the European Union, we, Japan, and so on. Okay, Nadia, do you have another question? Yes. Uh, John Isela from Nosphere is asking a question. Ambassador partially uh, responded, but still. Uh, organized support and programs to minimize abuse of financial support to Ukraine is absolutely necessary now and in the future. Ambassador, can you please comment on U.S. support to minimize financial abuse in Ukraine? Um, he's absolutely right. But it's also true that a fairly effective or excuse me, fairly effective systems, more than one, are in place. One for military aid, one for aid coming from USAID. Uh, it doesn't mean they can't be approved, and there's no reason why we shouldn't look at ways to improve it. But we also want to make sure that in this extreme situation, that is not used as an excuse for denying the aid Ukraine needs right now. Thanks. But I know that the administration and the Zelensky team are open to further uh, further tweaks in the supervisory system. Okay, another quick question, and then we'll be moving toward the end. Go ahead. Okay. Anonymous attendee is asking, 
should we not be focusing more on the post-war development of Ukraine's economy and on metrics the Ukrainian government should deliver on rule of law, corruption, and ease of doing business? Without that, all this funding and efforts won't ultimately deliver what they are intended for. Okay. Uh, the short answer is um, this is already happening. Um, there's been a Ukraine reconstruction process. There have been several international conferences on it, not always as effective as you would want, but still moving in the right direction. But the most important point in answering your question is that Ukraine is in the process of, of doing establishing accession talks for the EU. The EU's got more regulations than I can count, which is not always a good thing, but those regulations will kneecap corruption and enabling institutions in Ukraine. And so I'm confident at the end of that, we will see uh, a Ukraine which is largely corruption free. Also, the current aid we're sending to Ukraine has serious supervisory controls. And as I just mentioned, in responding to Morgan's question, other, other um, changes can be expected there. And you could be sure that reconstruction money is going to come with lots of supervision. Morgan, last question. Ambassador Yelchenko is uh, writing, there is a growing concerned opinion among Ukrainian experts, which I don't share, that Ukraine is gradually losing the last standing bipartisan support in U.S. Congress, a long standing in U.S. Congress. Ambassador Herbst, can you give your thoughts on this? So ambassador to ambassador question. Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I agree with Ambassador Yelchenko. I don't think that's going to happen. It is true. A danger has arisen in the past several years. It really goes back, of course, to President Trump's uh, less than responsible handling of his relationship with President Zelensky. Uh, but it's become much louder since the Republicans won the House majority uh, in November of 2022. Uh, the difficulty of uh, getting an aid package on the floor in the House is a serious one. We've talked about that a lot today. But it's only eight, six to 10 members of the House for whom killing aid to Ukraine is a priority. Then there are another 20, 25 who will speak and vote that way, but it's not necessarily a priority. And there remains majority support in the Republican Party in Congress for assistance to Ukraine because it's understood to be critical for American interests. And I think we're seeing um, how that group, along with Democrats, is dealing with the challenge coming from that eight group of eight to 10. And the problem has not been fixed yet, but I think we will see a positive resolution sometime in the next couple of months. That's a likelihood, but not a guarantee. Okay, John, then as we wrap up, there's always this thing coming up, some substantial or influential people say, let's, uh, let's have some compromises. Let's go to the peace table. Let's negotiate. Let's find a way out of this deal. Every both sides have to give some, and then of course everybody else says no. The only way out is for Putin to leave to defeat Putin. Uh, so, uh, what do you what do you say uh, well, to these right guys? Now, that like peace analysis, negotiate. Let's figure out how to get out of this thing without having the Russia. Let's basically say they got beat. There, there are several important points here. The first is Putin's objective in Ukraine to establish effective political control of the country has not changed since he began the big invasion. Uh, there have been statements by lesser Russians suggesting that maybe they'd be interested in a compromise, but until you hear it from Putin or Peskov speaking on Putin's behalf in a public manner, it ain't so. Point two, uh, every Westerner who calls for negotiations to find a way out 
is confirming Putin that the West is weak, that he can outweigh the West and achieve his gains in Ukraine because the West is unwilling to realize the challenge and is too interested in its, its own comfort to deal with a threat to its own interests. Uh, when Putin puts a serious proposal on the table, we should consider it. Before that, for Westerners, especially for US officials to talk about the need for negotiations, again, is just telling Putin to hang in there, be aggressive as hell, because the West is feckless. Okay, well, we've had a great discussion. Thank you, John. My this pleasure. It was one of the best and one of the most sought after by our members. Uh, we all got to remember this deal's not over. Uh, it's going to take fighting from everybody. We've got to work more on the administration and the, and the Capitol Hill. And then, you know, all these various areas are going to right. take the best effort that all of us could give. And so we got to keep the we got to keep fighting. We got to win this war, and also then we got the Herculean task of, of building Ukraine, which is going to be a huge uh, job in itself. And the private sector is getting ready to do, go it, and they're kind of starting and stopping, and they find a way to get some political risk insurance and and uh, reduce the risk, of, the more risk. We got to get businesses in there, creating jobs. So. It's just a Herculean task. So all of us got to work together. We've got to defeat Mr. Putin. We've got to build Ukraine. And number one, throw Mr. Putin out of Ukraine. So we have plenty to do in 23 and 24. So Ambassador, thank you very much. Thank we you. look forward to having you around again. And uh, as we say in the... You, U.S. Ukraine Business Council, full speed ahead. Right. Okay. Thanks, Morgan. I appreciate it. Thanks to everyone.